Is the spring force a conservative force or a non-conservative force? Non-conservative. Actually, it's conservative. We haven't really talked about that much. I just briefly mentioned that the only forces you're going to see this term that are conservative are the weight and the spring force. So here's the other conservative force, which is the spring force. Now, if the spring force is conservative, do you remember, does that mean that it has a potential energy or it doesn't have a potential energy? Conservative forces like the weight and the spring force, do those have potential energies? Yeah, after all, the weight has a potential energy, right? That's yeah. MGH. Right. Um, well, this is the other conservative force, so it also has a potential energy. Here's a formula that you might have seen in the textbook or in class. This is the formula for the spring potential energy. I'm going to write it this way now. We generally use U for potential energy, but now I have to say SP to show that this is the spring potential energy and not the gravitational potential energy. K is just a constant that basically tells us kind of how um, tight or springy the, uh, the spring is. Now, every spring has a natural length. The natural length is the unstressed length, the length that the spring would normally take if there were no outside forces on it. So there is no spring force when it's at the natural length. There's only a spring force when it's expanded or compressed. And x here is our displacement from the natural length. That's important to have in your notes. x stands for the displacement from the natural length. So let's see if we can label what x would be for this spring down here. If this is the spring at the natural length, try to draw in what distance represents x in that picture. That's good. And how about for this spring? What distance represents x there? All right, good. So over here, the displacement from the natural length would be this. And over here, the displacement from the natural length would be this. And this is a case, again, where all we care about is the magnitude, because we're squaring this anyway. I'll put a dot in here, though, just to show that all we care about is the magnitude, which means that expanding the spring by one meter has the same effect on the energy as compressing the spring by one meter. So this was the natural length. This would be the displacement. Uh, maybe it would be better in this formula to write this like this. This is how we normally write displacements, because it's the difference between what we had at the natural length and what our new length is. But unfortunately, in the textbook, they leave the delta out. But this really stands for a difference between two lengths, the natural length and the actual stretched or compressed length. So a common mistake would be, uh, do not plug in the overall length of the spring here. For example, suppose that they tell us that the spring is stretched to a length of 8 meters. Suppose they tell us that the spring is stretched to a length of 8 meters, and let's say they tell us that the natural length is 6 meters. What would x be? I'm sorry, I suppose. <laughs> uh, if the natural length two. is 6 meters and it's been stretched to 8 meters, what would x be? 2. Good. Not 8. Right. A lot of people, if they were in a hurry, would just pick up the, the, the nearest number that they see and plug in the 8 over here. But this doesn't stand for the length of the spring. It stands for the difference between what the length is now and what it would be at the natural length. So here we would plug in x equals 2. Good, not 8 or 6. So you can see here that the more you stretch the spring, the more energy will be stored in it. Mm -hmm. Or the more you compress the spring, the more energy will be stored in it. Suppose the spring is at its natural length. What's the energy when the spring is at its natural length? Yeah. Good. That's important. Uh, you might have noticed on the previous problems how many terms ended up being zero. There were, uh, oftentimes the kinetic energy or the potential energy was zero, and that simplified the equation. So we really have to look for things that are zero. That's part of the handout. I try to go through a lot of different situations where things are zero. Um, well, the spring energy is zero when the spring is at its natural length. By the way, um, let's say I have an object here. What would be the direction of the spring force on this box? Up, down, left, or right? Uh, let's just use our common sense about springs. Just based on our common sense about springs, we know this spring is trying to pull the box back towards the natural length. 
about if I put a box here, what would be the direction of the force on this box? To the right. Because here, the spring has been compressed and it's trying to expand back to the natural length. So we can be, use our common sense to figure out what the direction of the spring force is. The spring force is always parallel to the spring. It's trying to get back towards the natural length. So again, we have a kind of uh, shifting track. We have a box that's going to start at rest at the very beginning of the track and then start sliding around. There's no friction on the track. Uh, when we get down to this level portion, we're going to hit the spring. Um, and we want to know how far will the spring compress. Okay, so we, <clears throat> we start off with EI equals EF. Good. Let's label our initial and our final points. Okay, uh, the initials where the box is and the final point is what we are trying to find out. Let's label a point on the picture as the final point. I guess, well, when the spring compressed, it would be like somewhere in here. Yeah, so let's actually draw that. Good. It helps to actually build that into the picture. In fact, maybe we should fill this into the picture a little bit more. This is what the spring looks like at the beginning, but when we end, it's going to have compressed some. So here's our final position when it's compressed some. OK, good. Let's keep going. assuming energy will be conserved. Let's just double check that. So let's identify what are the forces on this object. For example, what are the forces on the object over here? Uh, the normal force and the weight. And here's what the velocity would look like. Mm -hmm. And the normal force is perpendicular to the weight, so, I mean, to the velocity, so it does zero work. Right, and the weight is a conservative force, so we don't include it down here. We should also think about what happens when we get to this point. <coughs> What will be the forces on the object at this point? Um, the force of the box on the spring. Now, what we're focusing on is the box. So we want to know what are the forces on the box, not what are the forces on the spring. So what would be all the forces on this box? The spring on the box. Yeah, what direction will that be in? To the left. Good. Because the spring is going to try to oppose being compressed. Good. And the other forces? Uh, weight or the normal force. And we can say now that the velocity is horizontal. Right. Okay. Well, the weight is a conservative force, so that's not going to be included here. The normal force is still perpendicular to the velocity, so that's not doing any work. How about the spring force? Is that going to give us a work that we need to plug in here? Uh, no. That's right, it won't. Why don't we have to plug in the work done by the spring force here? Because it's a conservative force. Yeah, as we memorized, the weight and the spring force are the two conservative forces this term. 
So you were right when you assumed this was going to be zero. So it is legitimate to say that we can use conservation of mechanical energy. Good. 